everyone. A pleasant good evening to you. We just praise God for another opportunity to be with you tonight. I am so blessed to understand and know that God has everything under his control. In the midst of this pandemic, in the midst of this season that we are going through, I want to also give you that assurance and have you to have that assurance in your salvation that God has made a way of escape for us. We just want to go before the throne of grace. Eternal Father, we just love you. We thank you for your grace, your mercy. We are invoking the power of the Holy Spirit in this gathering tonight. God, assuredly, a word has been birthed into our bosom, dealing with the heirs of God and the joint heirship that to which we all occupy as sons of the Most High God. Lord, we are praying for our friends near and far, family and loved ones who have lost loved ones even during this season. And most recently, we're praying for our brethren in far countries in South Africa that God will continue to guide them, will comfort their hearts during their loss. We here are celebrating victories on a number of different hands, and it is because of the power and the blood of Jesus Christ that we're able to stand firm and declare victory has already been won. I know, and I want to also encourage you that during this season of the pandemic, that we continue to follow the, uh, the laws of the land and obey our government officials by social distancing and making sure that you are collectively moving forward according to the word of God. This becomes a short petition of my heart as we get into the word of God tonight. We've been dealing with heirs of God and rulership. Paul in the book of Acts says something that is as much profound today as it was uh, when it was spoken. He stood in the midst of Ariagapus and said, Men of Athens, I perceive that all things and in all things you are very religious. Isn't that so interesting that the spirit of religion has transcended time and he's even arrived at our doorstep? This very spirit of religion is permeating the earth to a place of potential destruction. It is on the back of religion that the oppression that we see in our society today is being promoted. And I, too, want to make sure that we are clear, uh, those of us that are sons of the Most High God, that it is not religion that is going to save, and it's not religion that is going to bring us together, but it is the Word of God. During that time, the people were worshiping false gods and did not know or understood what it meant to be an heir of God. In verse number 23 of the 17th chapter, it says, For as I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, I even found an altar with the inscription to the unknown God. Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing him, I proclaim to you. God who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands. The profoundity of that statement, we are not worshiping a God that is made by hands. He has not been formed by any man, fashioned by any man, and he ought not to be worshipped like a man. He ought to be worshipped like a God, that, like the God that he is. Verse 26 says, nor is he worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, since he gave it all life, breath, and all things. And he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and boundaries of their dwellings, so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each of us. It goes on to say, for in him we live and move and have our being. 
as also some of your own poets have said, for we are also his offsprings. It's a powerful saying to be an offspring of Christ, an offspring of God. It says, therefore, since we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, something shaped by art and man's devising. So the God that we are serving, the God that we are worshiping, the God to whom we are an heir with in Jesus Christ is not made up of hands of gold or silver or trappings of wood or carved out of anything. Because we are literally worshiping the, create, the creation versus the creator. There's a Greek word called leronomio. It literally means a receiver of an inheritance, a beneficiary, which is what an heir is. First Peter chapter 3, chapter 1, verse 3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to live in hope, to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. To an inheritance, there's that word, inheritance, the heir from which we get um, inheritance. To an inheritance, incorruptible and undefiled, and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. You who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. As a summary of a thought, I want to just make sure we leave a nugget in your spirit here today. That because of this new covenant in God, this new covenant, we have become heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. I love the way as I meditated and looked at the various texts to supporting the spirit that the Lord had dropped in me to deal with this very subject of an heir. As I mentioned in our last gathering, when the heir is born, he has been designated as an heir throughout his entire life, throughout the life of that heir. They do not have to be concerned about the heirship, the, the kingdom in which they're going to inherit. They must now grow and develop and learn and have a relationship with the father so that the, 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 the rights, if you may, can be transferred by way of knowledge. My apostle, shepherd, shared with me many years ago the teaching on salvation through knowledge. Now, the knowledge that he was referring to does not find its origin or its existence in a head knowledge, but it finds its existence totally in the air and the rulership that God has placed in us by way of infilling us with the precious gift of the Holy Spirit and that residence and that resides in our hearts. Jeremiah chapter 31 says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them from the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. Isn't it so interesting and ironic that as we go through life, and even after we've accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior, we sometimes fall off the mark, if you may. But even in having broken that co covenant, God has made a way of escape for us. He has reconciled us back into himself by way of his covenant um, connection with the Son, Jesus Christ, that we who are born in him have now inherited. Verse 33 says, But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saying the Lord, I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. And I will, make, and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Oh, that's a powerful place for us to get excited about the word of God. When God says, I will be your God and you shall be my people. My people, my people. 
That's a covenant code, if you may, of the heirship to which you and I will ha now have a covenant relationship with the Father. Because he says, I will. Wherever God says, I will, that he will do. He says that I will not lie. I cannot lie. If I've made a promise, I will see it through to the very end. The only way the promise of God cannot be fulfilled in our lives is if we pack our bags and walk away from him. Oh, saints of God, friends around the world, as you're watching tonight, I do not want you to walk away from God. You must now, we must now understand what it means to have an airship, uh, access to the throne of God through Jesus Christ. It says, no more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, know the Lord, for they all shall know me. So now, you know, it's, it, there was a time when only a chosen few would understand the scriptures. But God says, I am going to send my son down through the earth and I'm going to have him shed his life so that you and I, everyone on the earth, can have a covenantal relationship with the Father. And you can know God for yourself. We must not know God for ourselves. There are no exceptions to this. We all must come to the knowledge and the saving, the saving grace of Jesus Christ. It is only in that will we be able to rule over the earth. The Bible lets us know that the meek shall inherit the earth. Oh, it's not, a, it's not talking about the feeble in any way, shape, or form. No, it's talking about you and I, we that are covenant kids with Jesus Christ, we will have a rulership position even in the midst of a pandemic. Do not, do not, repeat, do not allow yourselves to be disconnected from the reality and the fact of knowing your position in Christ. Because it's in our collective position in Christ, as I say collective, but I do mean individual position in Christ, that we are able to inherit the great and mighty things that God has in store for us. Verse 34 again, it says, No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord. For they all shall know me. From the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. Their sin I will remember no more. The state of sin consciousness is not one that I, I, I ascribe to. But to the extent that God has shed, sent his son to the earth to shed his blood, we must now understand that this, there is the potential for separation and that there is also the potential for remaining perpetually connected to the Holy, through the Holy Spirit with God. Let's look at the covenant, for example. Back in times gone, you know, there used to be what they call cutting covenant. Cutting covenant. And... The two men would get together and they would literally uh, come to an agreement. And in coming to that agreement, they would cut an animal down the middle. And they would place the animal, the bloody animal, and they would literally walk around the animal. And in walking around the animal after doing so, they would look at each other and say, now it's time that for us to cut the covenant. The blood that was shed by the animal is only part of that representation. Saints of God, Jesus Christ was not part of the representation. He was the fulfillment of the covenant that was purchased on Calvary. I want you to hear me. So now these men, they would look at the animals and they would look at the blood that was shed. Then from there, what they would literally do, they would cut their palms. Therein lies where we get cutting covenant. And as the blood would be shed, they would put their hands together and they would fuse the blood of each other. And what that meant was that they had a covenantal relationship and a promise to each other. And no one would be willing to break that covenant. How much more has God sent his son to die for us? To give us the example of what true covenant is. Verse 36, 35 of that Jeremiah text, it says, Thus saith the Lord, who gives the sun for a light by day. The ordinance of the moon and the stars for a light by night. Who disturbs the sea and it waves roar. 
The Lord of hosts is his name. Jeremiah tells us that there will be a new covenant coming. Amen. He was looking through time and he was literally seeing the fulfillment of the, the promise that God had made to Israel. He says the, this new covenant will be the final one and it will be by way of the sacrifice of God's only son. When Christ shed his blood on Calvary, he was actually cutting this new covenant. I like how the writer in the book of Hebrew puts it. He says, for this reason, he is the mediator of the new covenant by means of death for the redemption of the transgression under the first covenant. That those who are called may receive the promise of eternal inheritance. There is such a thing as the promise of eternal inheritance. Saints of God, I need you to get this in your spirit. And those of you that are watching by way of this broadcast. And those of you that are here in the sanctuary tonight. I want you to hear that God has made a provision in his word for you and I. And we ought not to take it lightly. We ought not to allow anybody in our sphere to take it lightly. During this season of the pandemic, amen, we ought to be able to gather our families around the word of God and pour into our families what it means to have a covenantal relationship with the Father. Oh, this is a very powerful uh, delivery of what it means to have an heirship with Christ. You see, it's so important for us to understand and know what the blessings of the covenant means. As you see in the example of men cutting covenant, from that day on, whenever one that owned anything, the other also became co-owner. Isn't that awesome? So now, Jesus Christ owns eternal life. And because we have cut covenant with Christ, we are now rulers of this eternal life. We are, I'm sorry, we are now heirs of this eternal life. That's a powerful place for us to operate and exist in. The fears of both men, the fears of both men were turned from, to faith. At the point of cutting the covenant, if you may, there was a fear that existed in these men because they would wonder, how would I fulfill the promise of the covenant that we have just now cut? But by the shedding of blood and by the fusing of that blood, they now move from fear to faith. The same thing operates for you and I, saints of God. When Jesus Christ shed his blood on Calvary, we ought not to be living in fear. We ought not to be looking to the left or to the right. We must keep our eyes stayed flat-footed and stayed on God. Because in staying flat-footed and knowing with assurance of our salvation, then we will not worry, we will not have fear, doubt, or unbelief. We see many are troubled in this season. They're dealing with psycho psychological problems, fear, doubt, and unbelief because of circumstances. I want to encourage your heart. Do not allow fear, doubt, or unbelief to be away. Understand what it means to be an heir with Christ. As joint heir, as a co-ruler, if you may, we have been given the authority to bind and to loose. We have been given the authority to walk boldly and come boldly through the throne of grace. And in approaching the throne of grace, because of that covenant that has been cut, the covenant that has been cut between you and God, between God and Christ, co-equal, we have this heirship. We have, we have now been engrafted into the kingdom of God. The very spirit of fear, doubt, and unbelief is permeating. It's dragging the emotion and the thought life of people down. And I want to always remind those of you watching that God has not given us that fear. And because he has not given us that fear and we are heirs to the throne of God, then why do we pick it up and run with it? We are worshiping this unknown God. I want to let you know that God has cut covenant with you and me by way of his son, Jesus Christ. 
Friend, long before we were born, we were already included in this blood covenant. The covenant was established long before the world was created. The covenant between God and his son, Jesus Christ. You see, Adam and Eve, they were part of that original. Adam was the first one. He was the first man. God had created this Adam. Adam was made perfect, and he was literally without fault. God, in his awesome wisdom, in his perfection, in the mind of God himself, he did not force Adam into a relationship with him. He says, I am putting you on the earth, Adam. You are perfect in creation. However, the choice to be a friend of God is all yours. I will not force it. The same thing today. God is not forcing us. We must embrace God in the airship of Christ Jesus. See, Adam was not controlled by God. It had to be his own decision. That's just the way God is. And we know how that story goes. We don't need to go through it tonight. But God, in his infinite wisdom, he knew what the future was. You see, long before Adam or before the world was created, God the Father and Jesus, they sat down and they looked into time and space and they knew that Adam and Eve, they were going to be tempted to sin and they would give in to that temptation. By doing this, they would be breaking their covenantal relationship with God. That meant that they could no longer be friends with God and would have to suffer the curse of the covenant of death. That is what the covenant of death means. It literally means to be separated from God. Not necessarily to be absent from the body in so many words or to have taken that last breath. But the ultimate covenant of death is when we, are, we have been separated from God. And we are not functioning, we are not operating in the airship by which God has laid out as a plan for us by way of salvation. That was a problem that was before God. He didn't want to lose Adam. Amen. And he didn't want to lose Eve, nor did he want to lose us as descendants. So God, in his infinite wisdom, he says, I am going to allow my son to come down to the earth. Oh, that's a powerful sight if I ever have one. That's the thought that crosses my mind every morning that I wake up, that God saw fit to lay his son's life down for us. Yes, I know that Jesus laid his life. But God, through his son Jesus Christ, when my feet hit the floor, when your feet hit the floor, that needs to be the paramount thought that you will understand what it means to have a covenantal relationship and heirship with Christ. It is a blood covenant based on the death of this second Adam. Someone who would be willing to represent everyone that was born after Adam. Oh, that's so powerful. See, in this plan of what we are calling a covenant, there came the other Adam. That other Adam is Jesus Christ. He is so awesome today, saints of God. That other Adam is Jesus Christ. It's in him. We talked about the in him principle. We must live in Christ and have Christ living in us so that we can have the rulership with which the Holy Spirit will empower us. This man would have to be willing to die for no wrongdoing. No wrongdoing of his own, but for the sins of every descendant of the first Adam. That is the Jesus that I preach to you today. He would be put to death as an innocent man. He was sinless, and yet and still he had to sacrifice. His death would, be made a, would make a way for you and I. This is the, this second man, Adam. He would be the substitute for the in this covenantal sacrifice, in this covenantal airship that you and I stand to gain even today as sons of the living God. That's about the place where I say God is always on time. The old church used to say he may not come when you want him to, but he is always on time. No, 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 I will not promote that falsehood because he says he is always there. He says, I will never leave you, nor will he forsake you. 
But to the extent that God is not contained by time, but man is contained by time, I will all offer you the fact that God is always on time. No matter what the situation that you or I may face, we must embrace the fact that as heirs to the throne of God, hmm, as co-rulership, amen, in Christ, we will not you ever usurp the authority of God. So I want to make sure that we understand very clearly. But as heirs and joint heirs, as rulers, God has empowered you and I so that we could promote the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. So in the fullness of time, God sent his son Jesus to the earth for and to be the second Adam. God implanted pureness, sinlessness in a virgin. It was not just an ordinary seed. No, it was not. It was pure sinlessness. If there is ever such a thing as purity, that was Christ personified by way of the Holy Spirit that impregnated this woman. And this woman gave birth to perfection, walking in shoe leather. The Bible makes it perfectly clear that while he was on this earth, he was sinless. And yet and still they chose to take his life. Oh, let me make that correction. He's, he said in his word, no, you cannot take my life. I lay it down. And because I've laid it down, I can pick it back up again. Oh, what a saint. Oh, what a powerful statement. Because I laid down my life, I can pick it. As a matter of fact, I'm going to go and get my life in three days. I will rise up again and declare that all heaven and earth must now bow down and worship me. This is the Jesus that I'm offering you today, saints of God. He became a perfect substitute. Jesus not only lived perfect, but he died a perfect death. As a sinless second Adam, he had been punished, but he willingly took the punishment for you and I. He was not only a representative in the covenant, but he was the covenant. In this new covenant that was made for us, Jesus became our brother. Jesus became our friend. Jesus became our savior. We ought not to minimize him. He is to be the Lord of all and the Lord over all. We are also his descendants. He took the curse of death for you and me, but the blessings were passed on. Isn't that awesome to have someone to take the blame? The covenant of the street sometimes would require someone to take the blame for the acts of another. That is true covenant relationship. But who else could lay down their life but Christ so that you and I would have the right to the tree of life? And eternal life is what God has made the provisions for us as heirs. The question that I now ask and pose to you is where do you stand? Where do you stand so that when that day comes, will you be able to say, or will it be able to be said of you, well done, my good and faithful servant? I want you to know unequivocally that God has made a provision in his word for you and me today. So that you and I could operate, we could reign here on the earth and have a clear understanding of what it means to have a relationship with God. Now, we can be more than just a friend of God. We can be his adopted child, his son. Isn't it so awesome? Have you ever seen a, a, a couple go out and they adopt a child? When they adopt that child, oftentimes and most often, the child is no, no longer called an adopted child. This is my son. This is my daughter. This, the same thing ap ap appeals to our situation here and now, friends. Because we have been adopted in, we have been engrafted into the family of God, we are sons of the living God. And it is in that position as a son that we have the right 
to an inheritance. Oh, that's a powerful place to, to begin to get excited about your position, our position in Christ. I want to present this gospel to you today as the good news that you have a position in Christ. And it's only in Christ that we should live. It's only in Christ that we should have our being. It's only in Christ should we have our existence because without him we are lost and lost forever. I want you to hear me. The work has been completed for us. Jesus Christ is our blood savior. Jesus has taken on the details. He has literally gone through all of the trappings of the world, everything that you can possibly come in contact with. He has already conquered that for us. For that reason, you ought to give your life over to him. For that reason, we ought to be willing to serve him. Every step of the way, we ought to be willing to serve the God of our salvation. Friends, my time is moving very quickly, but I want you to hear this today. If there's any one person that, that's watching this broadcast, this recording, it's not complicated. It is not very complicated. All we need, all we need is to have a willing heart. It's to have the heart that says, I want to repent. I want to turn my back on yesterday. I want to turn my back on the world and give my heart over to God. Those of you, I want to invite you. If you have experienced this passion of a heart transplant, if you may, I want you to go to our website, www.livingwordc.org, and write us a comment. I will receive it. We'll be praying with you. We'll be praying for you. So that God will guide you in the right relationship. In your local area, wherever you are, find a Bible-believing ministry and connect with. If you don't have one, and especially in this pandemic season, I want you to connect with Living Word Church. We will pray for you. We will father you in the gospel and grow you in the fear and the admonition of the Lord. So that the word of God will have a root in your heart that you might not sin against him. And you will go and understand what it means to be an heir. We love you tonight. We just bless you today for just being a part of this gathering. I know that there are many of our local assembly that's watching. We're encouraging you to continue to support this ministry. You can do so by going to our website again, livingworddc.org, or via Givelify. And sow your tithes, your offerings, and first fruits. And in walking in that obedience you will reap the benefits of airship. We love you until we see each other again. May God bless you. And remember, keep your mind on the Lord. In Jesus' name.